over my head. I hear music in the air over my head. I'm Dr. Anastasia Scott. I'm the Director of Educational Programming here at Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. In my role, I train all docents on the content of the tours. I also handle all of the educational programming for adults in K through 12. So this is um, one of our biggest features here at the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. This is our 1830s kitchen. It is very much a functioning 1830s kitchen. We still cook in this kitchen from October through May of each year. Some of the features for this kitchen includes an open hearth fire, a down hearth. This would be called stew holes. And this is our beehive oven. In the 1830s, at the Herman Grima home, there would have been three to four enslaved people um, that would have cooked in this kitchen. They would have started about four to five a.m. You would have had um, a preteen enslaved person that would have begin the fire here in the open hearth that the other two cooks would have gone to the French market in the area in the French Quarter neighborhood to purchase the produce, to purchase uh, the fresh vegetables, uh, poultry, meat, anything that would have been needed for the day. And they would have done all of this in preparation for dinner which is a midday meal that we would have prepared daily. The mistress of the home or the wife of the home would have likely supervised the cooking, but she would have not been uh, cooking daily with the enslaved people. So the cooking that took place in this kitchen contributed to the Creole cooking tradition in New Orleans. The enslaved people that would have prepared the meals daily in this kitchen in an urban enslavement environment in the 1830s would have contributed to a large uh, sustaining culinary tradition that we now know as Creole cooking. They would have taken, they would have taken influences from Native Americans, the sassafras that they would have uh, had uh, available to them what we now know as a uh, filet um, for the gumbo uh, dish that is so very uh, renowned um, in the New Orleans culinary tradition. They would have also uh, been exposed to a world of spices that would have been available to them because New Orleans was a major port in the 1830s at that time. Now, one of the uh, major understandings of the enslaved people that would have prepared meals and cooked in this kitchen is that they would have been not only bilingual, but they would have been trained in the French um, tradition of cooking. The family um, that they serviced were Catholic Creole families that would have very much um, would have practiced and ran a French service style of dining um, in their dining room, and it would have been offered to uh, their colleagues, their friends, and their extended family in the dining room. So the cooks would have began at 4 or 5 a.m. They would have cooked all day to prepare a meal that would have been ready for, at the time, dinner. So supper would have been after dinner, and dinner was a midday meal that started between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. So the enslaved cooks would have been in this kitchen um, from at least 4 a.m. to the time where they would have prepared um, the meal um, and served the meal in the house. One of the things um, as it relates to laws regarding slavery was that the enslaved people were unable to read and write. It was illegal. That 
means that these very complex uh, French cooking, um, in terms of the French cuisine, would have been prepared by memory. The mistress of the home would have shared, they would have planned the menus, but the enslaved people would have actually executed and prepared the meals by memory. And so this is sort of the crux of Creole tradition as it relates to enslaved people. So the Herman of uh, Greenland and Gallier uh, historic houses, one of the things um, that we are known for, another is our Creole uh, cookery book. And this book was published in 1885 by our owner and operator, the Women's Exchange. So the Women's Exchange was started in 1881. And so this book was published roughly four years later in 1885. Now, one thing to understand about um, early cookbooks was that we're talking about well-to-do European American women that not too long um, before that they published, compiled the recipes and published this book, they had um, enslaved people in their own households. So the interesting thing about um, this cook cookbook, and many like it at the time, was that they compiled these recipes by sort of looking over the shoulder of one, the formerly enslaved people, and then at that time in that post-reconstruction era, they would have been looking over the shoulder or maybe doing some um, interviewing of uh, the people that served them at the time. So a lot of these recipes, this entire book, in fact, comes from the formerly enslaved people that would have serviced these well-to-do uh, European-American women. So I want to... Um, Read the preface or just an excerpt from the preface so you understand. And I do uh, would like to note um, the importance of in the preface, there's a, an image of a mammy. And that's important. And I'll read uh, the excerpt as to why that's important. The Creole Cookery Book edited by the Christian Women's Exchange of New Orleans, Louisiana, 1885. In this time, glorious with the general diffusion of learning, it is befitting that the occult science of the gumbo should cease to be the hereditary lore of our Negro mammies and should be allowed its proper place in the gastronomical world. So essentially, you know, let's let's sort of let's sort of break this down. The occult science of the gumbo should cease to be the hereditary lore of our Negro mammies. So they're talking about this understanding that one, because of laws regarding slavery, the um, the enslaved cooks were not allowed to read and write. Therefore, they had to memorize all of these recipes. So all of these recipes over generations of enslaved people would have been memorized. And so, you know, when they, when they talk about should cease to be the hereditary lore of our Negro mammies, they're talking about the fact that it's not written down, it had not been written down up until that point, and the enslaved cooks um, in this particular urban environment were memorizing these recipes and they were passing it down from one cook, one generation of cook to the next. And so them writing it down um, and publishing these particular cookbooks was, um, of course, the literary contribution to uh, Creole cookery. However, the the work and the nuances of how to prepare these meals were most certainly uh, African descended. 
So I, I do want to explain sort of the methods of cooking that took place in this kitchen. This is called a swing cream. This would have helped with it, with you actually accessing either the pot or the kettle uh, easily. The wood Indian slave woman would have likely been dressed in a full length cotton dress. And so it would have been very hazardous and easy um, to set her clothing ablaze. So she would have had at least this swing crane um, instead of hovering completely over uh, this open fire. This uh, kitchen is very hot, uh, needless to say. Um, and so they had to labor uh, in this kitchen from 4 a.m. through midday dinner um, between 2 and 4. Um, they would have likely taken their meals in between um, moments to take their meals in between the family being serviced um, with having uh, the, the enslaved wait staff take over. Uh, they would have been sort of light meals in between um, their duties. This is a beehive oven. <clears throat> this is called an ash oven, where it's, of course, taking all the ashes. It takes a, a number of um, hours to heat. You actually begin a fire in here, and once the fire was began, you wait a few hours so you get to the correct temperature, and the only way for you to determine whether the fire was that, for example, uh, 375 to 400, that precise, you would have to re reach your hand in there, and depending on how long your hand stayed before you were like uh, extremely, uh, of course, to the point where you would burn, that would determine the temperature that they needed in order to put, you know, whatever breads that they needed to make. Um, the other uh, method, this is called a rotisserie. You would actually take and uh, put your meat on this spike in the middle, and then you would put it before the fire. And that's the rotisserie. And last but not least, you have what you call the stew holes. And this is um, good for stewing, this is good for uh, boiling, this is also good for making those very uh, complex French sauces um, that would have formed the basis of uh, French cuisine, and then later this fusion of this Creole cu cuisine that was created here in the world. And so having this up, this would be which you, you know, a modern day version of a burner. And so you would have sort of this grid, the furthest away, this is a, a coal burning basket. There's coals in this basket. And then you would take this grid, the furthest away determines whether the fire is high or low. So if you take this grid and it's further away from the fire, it's on low. Of course, when you flip it over, close to the fire, that means the fire is on high. This is the courtyard. This is where both leisure and labor took place you would have had enslaved people attending to the stables, stable management. You would have had uh, enslaved people ironing, washing clothes, cooking, food prep. You would have, they would have been doing a number of things um, in this courtyard attending to the family. Life in an urban uh, environment as an enslaved person was much more about mobility than it is about stasis or being in an isolated environment like that of a plantation. These ins urban enslaved people would have been running errands for their enslavers. They would have been 
buying all of the groceries needed to cook for the day at the local market and they would have also been purchasing um, things for themselves um, as well when they were out running errands. So when the enslaved um, individuals, particularly those who were cooking in the kitchen, would have, a re would have ran the errands to purchase the produce at the local French market, they would have had an opportunity to visit with friends look at some of the items on sale to buy at the local market or even grab a cup of coffee. Although this, not, this does not uh, equate freedom, but these were certain processions um, and concessions that they were given in an urban environment versus being on a plantation where it is very isolated and the only, piece, the only other people you would interface with were other slave-owning European Americans um, that visited the plantation. Between 1820 and 1860, the slave trade accounted for a significant portion of the South's economy. You would have had planters, artisans, merchants coming to New Orleans um, as one of the major urban um, slave depots to purchase enslaved people that would have manned their fields of cotton and sugar, which were booming industries by the time of the 1830s when this home was built. The first family that moved into this home and commissioned uh, the building of it was the Hermans. The Hermans, um, Samuel and Emrith Herman, came from the German coast. Both of them had deep ties with the planters on the German coast. When they moved to New Orleans, Samuel Herman's firm, he earned his living with a number of job titles. Commodities broker, exchange broker. He was a commission merchant. And what that meant was all of the money the planners needed cash, the planners needed credit, and the planners needed enslaved people in order for them to continue to move southwest uh, for not only the cotton frontier, but to move uh, slavery west. As they wanted to develop more land, they needed more enslaved people, and as one of the major, the nation's largest depots, um, and markets for enslaved people, they, they would have likely gone to Samuel Herman, who would have been that New Orleans merchant, to get them money, connect them with banks. Um, and his firm was a commission-taking firm that would have funded a lot of these planters' needs when they came to New Orleans. So his family earned their wealth in line with the cotton, boom, the cotton boom of the 1830s. So this dining room that we're standing in is an indication of that wealth that was generated, um, especially during that 1830s cotton boom, where his commission-taking firm would have funded and taken commission for thousands of uh, the sales in the transactions as it relates to mortgages, not only on enslaved people, but mortgages uh, for land and so on and so forth. As uh, practicing Creole Catholics um, in the New Orleans French Quarter in the 1830s, they would have lavished their guests, their uh, esteemed uh, colleagues in this French dining style of service. So you would have had a staff of enslaved cooks that would have brought the meals into this butler's pantry. They would have taken the food out of the pots that was cooked in the kitchen building behind us and would have been placed on the fine serving china. The, then the enslaved waiters would have been serving the Hermans and their esteemed guests and extended family um, for this French service uh, dining style 
where they would have a midday meal between two and four that would last anywhere from three to four hours. This table that you see here represents the bare table at the end of two to three courses of meals that would have been served for this midday meal. So it would have began with two to three table linens where you would have anywhere between four to 12 dishes served in each course. And with the exchange of each course, you would have had um, one tablecloth taken off. So an enslaved person would have had to reset, take off all of the, take off these, you know, sort of hurricane lamps that you see here. They would have taken off all of the, the dishes, cleared the table, had that second layer. Again, reset the table with a new set of dishes, anywhere between eight, uh, six, four to 12 dishes. And then for the final course, which was always served on the bare table, would have been the dessert course. And so this was the lifestyle that was led um, by this family, particularly in the 1830s, um, as their wealth, particularly um, Mr. Samuel Herman, as his wealth rose with the cotton boom industry um, in the 1830s, um, his wealth would also fall with the panic of 1837. And so in 1837 through 1844, he and his wife um, had to file bankruptcy. And uh, the person that actually uh, filed their bankruptcy, ended up purchasing this home. And so uh, in 1844, he and his wife, uh, Mr. Samuel Herman, ended up moving with their daughter on Conti Street, their daughter and her husband. And the home was then purchased by the home's second owner, uh, notary Felix Grima. He was the judge, um, and then he was appointed notary in 1833. This was an extremely lucrative position because at that time in 1833, when he was appointed notary, any document that needed to be made legal had to be notarized. And so at that time, when enslaved people, uh, at that time, enslaved people were considered real estate. And in order to conduct and purchase an enslaved person, you would be conducting a real estate transaction. And all of those hundreds of thousands of transactions of enslaved people um, would have been um, partially done by Felix Grima. And so um, he made so much money directly off of those um, transactions of enslaved people as real estate, as property. Um, so that's why, how he earned his wealth. And at that time, there weren't that many um, other notaries in the area. So all of those uh, thousands of transactions of enslaved people would have been done by him and he would have made tons of money. I mean, I, we all know. <laughs> I don't need to um, uh, express enough how much money he would have made. He, he made enough to uh, purchase this home and um, he himself, again, anywhere between 1831 and 1865, there were between eight and 15 enslaved people uh, on this property, laboring and inhabiting the property. ...of American slavery. The Herman Grima and Gallia Historic Houses um, has made it a priority to reckon with the legacy of slavery. And they began with firstly researching the history of the enslaved people on the property. So as of right now, we have researched about 60 enslaved persons that labored and inhabited the Herman Grima house. And with that um, research, we are continuing to build on that to um, digitize it and then we are also expanding our interpretation um, with our programming as it relates to um, building on the work that began in the late 1990s. Now 
we are historically situated um, in a cultural landscape where you have historic house museums and you have plantation uh, museums and plantation sites in the South um, that are on a wide spectrum of how they are reckoning with the legacy of slavery. So, of course, you know, our, um, our rural contemporary, uh, the Whitney Plantation, has is on sort of the other end of the spectrum in the sense that they're interpreting their museum and their historic site, particularly as it relates to uh, being a plantation site where they're specifically focusing on the enslaved. On our end, we are continuing to use the information um, in terms of marginalized populations to not only talk about the enslaved, but to talk about a plethora of marginalized populations that would have uh, been connected to the house. Samuel Herman was Jewish, so we'd like to expand that programming on what was the Jewish experience in New Orleans. Um, of course, the Native Americans were uh, the first inhabitants of um, this space that later became New Orleans, the site. And so what would that experience look like? Not only that, but in terms of the legacy of slavery, we are very much um, reckoning with that to the degree that we're seeking funding for not only the research um, to continue to build on the work that was initiated in the late 1990s, but to also, um, we've also added it to our strategic planning um, and our strategic plan over the next um, five to 10 years. And so um, in terms of how, in terms of 21st century storytelling, we are very much um, headed in the direction of inclusive histories. Um, one that does a historical service to lift those voices of the enslaved people that inhabited, uh, helped construct, and also um, occupied uh, and maintain um, these two historic houses. And so I hope that um, the work that I'm doing, as well as uh, all of the the people on our staff and our board continue uh, in that progressive direction so that we can continue uh, to contribute to this national understanding and this national reckoning um, of the legacies of slavery.